G'day guys, Mac with the Art of Circle, and today we're going to be talking about 3D printing for your hobby. So the reason I want to talk about this is this topic is in a bit of a funny place where people know it exists, some want to get into it, some are afraid of it, uh, others think it's mm, the technology isn't there yet, there's a whole host of things that come to mind. People also want to see recommendations on printers, but they don't want to be you know, bought and paid for or anything like that. They don't want chilling, they don't want uh, false information or overblown hype. They also don't know what type of printer would suit them best, what their needs might be. So today we're going to cover off on how these things work, talk about the technology, the two main types of 3D printers, which you can see in front of you, and we're going to be talking about slicing as a principle in both resin and in filament, and then we'll, well, we'll go from there into some sort of recommendations, but well, I don't know what your unique situation will be, so my recommendations are going to be a bit broad. But if you're willing to bear through to the end, I think you might find this video useful. Anyway, let's get into it. And to start with, SLA and FDM printers. So these are the two main types of printer you're going to come across. They both have their purposes. So to start with, SLA. Now, SLA is it's a pretty good actual medium to work in. But there are trade-offs, okay? So for example, SLA printing or stereolithography, but really we just call it resin printing. The whole point of this is it was a process designed in the 80s and they're using rapid curing resins that cure in ultraviolet light. And by showing this light on a particular area, we can create a single slice or slide of a given object and by moving one slice up a level and then creating another slice underneath it and stacking these together we create a 3d uh, render of an object and the more accurate you are able to make this render and the smaller the increments between each step the closer we get to a very accurate 3d render of something but in real life, this is kind of like those cardboard puzzles you would get of something like, you know, Tutankhamun's head made out of cardboard and you'd stack all the pieces together and it would form the shape of his head, but with all these big steps. That's essentially what we're creating just on a microscopic scale. Now, the other process here is FDM. Now, with FDM, what we have is we have a type of deposition printing. So what's happening here is we're fusing filaments together, and hence the name, FDM, Fused Deposition Modeling. And we have a consistent plastic feed where the plastic is heated up to a molten state, and then it is laid out almost like you are gluing or cementing a continuous strand onto the build plate. And as this strand is drawn, it's able to draw into three dimensions and building up layers, again, similar to the resin process, we are able to create three-dimensional shapes. The difference between the resin process and this one is that this one has very obvious uh, rounded edges due to the type of uh, extrusion process that's going on here versus these flat panels. So you get more deformation and hence uh, stronger layer lines between the two. And these machines are, in at least in retail models, not quite capable of the levels of resin printers when it comes to accuracy and quality. Now, the two types of material you're going to see are photopolymer resins, which are, of course, used in our SLA printers, and filament, which is used in our FDM printers. So photopolymer resins come in many different types. The one thing they all share in common is that they cure in the presence of ultraviolet light, and they're considered to be somewhat toxic. Now I say somewhat because every one of them ranges in the level of toxicity, but treat them all as if they're really bad because most of them are. When you handle them, you want to be treating these resins with the utmost respect. Don't obviously drink them. Try not to get them on your exposed skin, so wear things like latex gloves, wear appropriate clothing when handling them. Also, don't aerosolize them, don't heat them up, don't uh, enclose yourself in an area where these resins can be found and you can inhale them because it will do damage to you over time. Unfortunately, because this technology is relatively new, we don't fully understand yet how much damage it can do over time. So the more precautions you can take when handling it, the better. Then filament, on the other hand, apart from a few fumes that may be released 
during the melting process is actually pretty safe. You can touch it, you can handle it, you can probably lick it. Some of it's even considered to be food grade and lab grade. It's pretty good stuff. Uh, and that's as a raw material. Now filament comes in these big spools, usually one kilogram, but you can get up to five kilogram spools. And when you put them onto your machine, you simply plug it into the hot end through the extruder and away it goes. So with that in mind, let's talk a little bit about how this process works. So we'll start here with an SLA printer and it doesn't really matter what the type is because the principles are relatively the same between different ones. What you're going to find is you have a top sensor. Now there is also a bottom sensor. It's kind of a bit hidden by the vat in this image. What the sensor is doing though, in this particular model is it's telling the print head when it's at the top or at the bottom. It does not determine position, relatively speaking, in a scale terms. What it is doing is it is saying, once you have triggered me, I know that for every rotation of the screw, this will move a certain distance away from me. And that's how it knows where it is. It is not real time monitoring. So many of these VR printers have to have a feature installed in them which tells them where they are at and saves into memory where it is on that screw once it has been zeroed in order for it to continue working. If they do not have that in and there is a power outage, the print has to start over. These are actually a part that I find fails surprisingly often because they're usually very cheap sensors. The next part is the main print head. Now this is where it is secured to, the build plate is secured to the actual machine itself. The print head moves up and down along the Z axis screw and it is guided along a linear rail, which is what keeps it square and gives it that really perfect alignment. All the Z axis screw is doing is transferring motion to it in order to raise it up and down. The build plate itself is the surface upon which we are printing inside the printer. The vat is where the resin is stored and the bottom of the vat is called the FEP. Now this is a type of polymer, see-through, uh, transparent or translucent material. And that's what's called an FEP. And what this material is doing is it is forming a barrier surface between the resin and the LCD screen, or it could be another type of screen, but we'll say LCD screen in this example. And what is happening is it's a surface that we can peel cured resin off, a relatively, uh, low friction material it's made out of. And so what happens is we shine a light source through the bottom of the printer, through the LCD screen, and through the FEP into the vat. Whatever shape is not blocked out by the LCD screen becomes exposed to this light source. That shape cures, and that cured piece of resin is the slice that is to be pulled off the FEP by the build plate and remain attached to the build plate. And this is the model that you are printing. Now, when it comes to FDM, things are slightly different because in an FDM printer, we have a filament spool up the top. Now this can go through a runout sensor down to the print head or extruder. Now in this particular model, which is one of my models uh, that I use quite frequently, what you have is you have the extruder being built into the hot end. Not all printers have this. Sometimes the extruder, which is the part that's pulling the filament, that part can be a separate component. But these days it is most common to see that the extruder is built into the print head. This machine also has an ABL probe, so an auto bed level probe. This is becoming pretty much a must have on all printers. Five years ago, this was something you would uh, retroactively add to your printer. You would have to wire it in. You would have to do all sorts of programming. Now, they just come with it, and it makes life a lot easier because below that is the build plate, and the build plate is where all the action happens. On these, they are heated. They need to be heated in order to get correct bed adhesion, so the plastic to stick to the build plate. And the build plates are suspended on tensioned springs. And the reason this is done is, well, it's actually the screws doing everything. The springs are just holding it up and absorbing vibration. The Z, Y, and X axis work with one another in order for the head to move around the machine and to draw the part. 
There are different types. There are things like core XY. This is a typical XYZ way out. The main point is that plastic gets melted to form the shape of the part. So what is happening inside that nozzle? Well, what we have here is PTFE, so polytetrafluoroethylene uh, off the top of my head. The PTFE tube is a low friction tube with a relatively tight tolerance to the size of the filament that you are using. Now the filament could be nylon, it could be ABS, it could be PLA. Not super important for the purposes of this video, but I mostly use PLA for things like terrain. So that PTF tube is guiding uh, the filament into first the coupling, which is only holding the tube in place. Then the heat sink. Now the heat sink is called the cooling zone here. And the reason that is, is because we do not want to melt the plastic here. We do not want molten plastic because it's just going to clog it up. So this area is kept cold. But as you can see, it has to move through the heat break next. Now the heat break, this section here, what is happening in there is it's trying to stop the cold zone and the hot zone from interacting with one another. It is literally acting like an insulator between the two. And it does this by providing an air gap and minimal surface area to allow materials to transfer heat from one medium to another. Often, these are made of things like titanium, okay? And the very best of these machines will be all in one nozzles where it's made out of a single piece of material. However, to save money, many of these manufacturers make heater blocks out of aluminium, they'll make the uh, heat break out of titanium or steel or stainless steel and another aluminium heat sink on top of that. The very best ones though are one piece. Now, in the bottom end here, you have the heater block. Now the heater block is usually a block of aluminium it has a thermistor, which is essentially a thermometer. It's telling you what temperature it's running at. And it uses this in order to tell how much energy to put into the heater cartridge. Now the heater cartridge is a probe that runs a uh, low voltage current through. And what happens is that this is a controlled short circuit like most electronic heating is. And the more electricity it runs through it, the more resistance there is, the greater the heat created. And by controlling the ratio of heat, we get a consistent temperature. That's what's going on there. And this heater block transfers that heat to the brass nozzle. And the brass nozzle is where all of the melting actually occurs of plastic. And the plastic that is coming in through the PTF tube behind it, it's acting like the plunger in a syringe and it is pressing, forcing or injecting the plastic out the end of the nozzle. And this process is called extrusion. Now the quality of your 3D print is going to be dictated by how small the nozzle is. And the speed is dictated by how large the nozzle is. And what do I mean by this? Well, larger nozzle means more material can be forced through in a given time frame because the plastic takes time to melt. Plastic and plasticization, which is what it's actually called, it's not melting technically. Plasticization, because it is an insulating material, it takes a moment. So there is an upper limit to how fast you can feed material through a restriction and have it melt. Now, in advanced applications in the plastics industry, this can be done by literally using friction to melt the plastic. But in this instance, we use heat and these machines are not strong enough to force that kind of friction. So we're using heat to plasticize the material to make it uh, sticky and allow it to deposit and keeping the polymer chain intact. A small nozzle means that you're going to have a very small bead and a small bead means that there is a very reduced layer line because the layers are smaller and they have less of a profile or contour to them. But they are slow because you're producing less material out of that very, very tiny nozzle hole. On the other hand, a large nozzle hole means you get to go very fast because you can put a lot of material through this large surface area in a short amount of time. But the consequence of this is well, you have a much poorer surface finish and which you choose is entirely up to you. So now that I've spoken about the functioning of these two types of machines, let's talk about the applications of these two types of machines. So SLA, what do you use it for? Well, you use it for precision. If you want something that looks really, really good, 
and it's usually small because SLAs are much more limited in size and proportional to cost, especially so, you produce it in an SLA printer. So if you want high-end miniatures, like the level of someone like a Forge World or a Games Workshop or a Bolt Action, anything like that, you will produce them easily in an SLA printer. In fact, many of these SLA printers are at such a high resolution, you can't even tell. And in fact, companies like Games Workshop, they make their prototype miniatures now in 3D printers just like these ones. Well, actually, they're a little bit bigger and more expensive, but the same principle is there and they're easy to spot. But that is how good the process is. Model masters are now made in these machines. On the other hand, if you want to print terrain, an SLA, well, again, that size limitation, not to mention the cost, the cost of material, well, it can be up to $100 for, a, say, a Serratech, uh ABS-like resin. It'll cost you $25 or a quarter of the price for the same volume of material in PLA filament, PLA Plus, which is a um, an additive version of PLA. That means that it's four times more expensive to make the same sized object in an SLA as it is in an FDM. And that's before you take into account the waste of the SLA process because, well, the SLA process has things like supports. The FDM typically doesn't because you try and pick processes that suit each type of manufacturing method, which speaking of FDM, manufacturing terrain it is the master of terrain and you can produce a lot of terrain very quickly now a lot of people have a bit of a distaste for fdm printed terrain because they saw the type of terrain being printed five six seven years ago and how rough it is and especially stuff that is still put on forums today by people who well frankly don't know what they're doing and because of this, they see this ugly terrain with big mold lines and layer lines on it, and they think, no, nah, I do not want to go near that. And that's actually pretty far from the truth. Modern FDM printing is pretty much as accurate as where resin was seven, eight years ago in consumer hands. That is how much it's narrowed down the gap. And if you use something like a 0.01 millimeter nozzle on an FDM printer, yes, the prints will take a very long time, but they're going to be incredibly high quality. And even just using a stock out of the box printer like this one shown, which is an Ender 3S1, of which I have two currently running, um, fantastic machines. When you're using these printers, the standard out of the box quality with cheap PLA, I can produce a six by four table of top quality terrain in just a week. And that terrain is very much what I said, top quality. The layer lines are so fine that if you get a decent undercoat onto them, a decent base coat by can, especially if you use filler primer and the terrain is well designed, you will think it is injection molded plastic. That's how good it is. And that is the use for FDM. FDM is also really handy for when you are trying to do things which require, um, larger parts. So you want to make yourself a parts uh, holder, a parts carrier, a tub, something like that, FDM printer, because the standard size on these things these days is a minimum of 250 by 250 by about 300 millimeters. In the uh, early times, well, it was about half that, maybe a quarter in some cases. And I think the end of three is probably the one that started that particular size. And it is very common to find 300 by 300 by 400, 400 by 400 by 400, like the sizes are getting bigger. Contrast that with SLA. SLA, well, if you have a print head which is 11 inches from corner to corner, you have quite a big and usually a $1,200 plus SLA. And I'm talking 1200 Australian here. If you're up to something like, say, an Elegoo Jupiter size, anything in that region, you are going to be paying thousands and that is consumer level let alone going up to the next level if you want to go up to something that's using say lasers instead of uh, light projection or leds to get the light source in the sla it is going to cost a fortune but to reinforce the point the sla despite the size limitation is going to produce the better quality miniature but the elephant in the room here is 
which of these types of printer is better for you when it comes to safety? Because this is the one that people often don't talk about. If you have a young family or you live in a cramped apartment, which of these are you going to be able to use? And the answer is simple. It's an FDM. There's no two ways about it. There is nothing in here that is so dangerous and so toxic it's going to hurt your family. And if you thought there was something with the fumes, well, stay away from those materials. Use in a well ventilated area, open a window, whatever it might be. But I guarantee you it's going to be nowhere near the level of the SLA printer when it comes to a harmful materials such as toxins. The SLA, on the other hand, suffers from a raft of issues in this regard. The chemicals used in the cleaning are toxic. The chemicals used in the printing are toxic. The leftover materials are toxic. The waste products are all toxic. Uh, and we're talking things like your gloves that you used to handle the material, toxic. The spatula used to scrape the material off the bill plate, toxic. You need to have these things stored in such a way that it is not going to cause harm to you and the, uh, your family, those around you, roommates, whatever it might be. So those are key considerations. Modern 3D printers, and I've got a Creality one here. Both of these are machines I own. That's why I chose to use them in here and because they make good examples. This Creality unit, and you can just sort of make it out through the uh, screen. That is a full-size filter cartridge, and it does a fantastic job during running of removing the odor from the room. So it is working. However, the odor is still there, and you know it when you open up that hood. So you can't eliminate it entirely. Therefore, I do not recommend SLA printers for people in small cramped houses, especially people with children. Put them in an outdoors area, put them in a shed, in a garage, and definitely put them somewhere where kids cannot access it. And if you do have kids and you have this stuff around, I highly suggest that you go onto the safety data sheets for these uh, particular materials. You can go online and find uh, information on chemicals, in particular these different brands, and they will have what to do in the event of a poisoning. Have that information printed out and let your spouse or significant other know where that is kept. Because if your kid does have the stuff, ingest it in some way, your spouse is probably not into this. They're not going to know what the hell to do in the situation. You might not know what to do in the situation. Therefore, if you have something printed out, they can read it, go, all right, do I call triple zero or 911, whatever your different country uh, emergency number is? Do I contact a poison hotline? I mean, I would just say get into hospital if they drink the stuff, but uh, you know, don't induce vomiting. Do you induce vomiting? All these sorts of things, okay? You need to know the information. So take every precaution you can or don't take the risk in the first place. Now, that sounds very intimidating, I understand, but we need to treat this like adults, and unfortunately, that is the downside of this technology. You're either willing to put up with it and with those safety precautions, which frankly are not that absurd, or you're not. Now, in my case, I live in a remote area. My wife and I don't have kids yet, so I have a large uh, detached hobby uh, shed, 12 meter by 6 meter, um, room devoted just to 3D printing and gaming. I can make as much mess and noise and smell and whatever in there as I like because there is no one who's going in there who's going to be affected. I have all the appropriate protective equipment such as masks, gloves, coveralls, whatever in there. If there is a chemical spill, I have ways of mopping it up, cleaning it, mitigating it. That is a best case scenario for this technology. My FDMs though, I could set that on the kitchen bench and it's probably gonna cause no harm. So when it comes to safety, Choose the correct machine for your circumstances. And I can't tell you what those circumstances are. Now, from here, what I want to go is I'm going to go and show you how to slice in SLA and talk about where a lot of people are failing in these machines. And while heat is a significant one because they need to be warm when it comes to the resin, people are failing in other key areas of importance. And in particular, it's how they support their miniatures and understanding what the process is, the density of supports, size supports, all of that. So I'll cover off on that. Then I'm going to do something very similar for the FDM printer. All right, so I'm going to treat this little section as a bit of a 3D printing 101, especially when it comes to slicing, because a lot of people want pre-sliced files. I don't like doing pre-sliced files for STLs that I create. The reason why is everyone should be setting them up 
specific to their machine and what they know works best. But I'll give you the pointers as far as I see it today. So the first thing I'm gonna do here is bring in my slicing software. This one's Chitu Box, it's the latest version, but it's not important what slicer it is, they all work in a very similar way. Now the first thing that I need to do here is this is set to a generic machine. As you can see, there's no real inputs. So I need to add a machine. So I go into settings, I'm gonna click up here on the plus, I'm gonna add the Elegoo Satin S, because I have one of those. Might come in here and scroll up till I find Creality, because I've got a few of those. Um, add in my different models that I have. I have quite a few different um, <laughs> printers. Uh, this is all the resin printers I currently own. I sold off all my Anycubics. Now, what's gonna happen in the background of this program is the slicer, whichever machine I pick, it's going to change the build plate to be particular to that machine and give you a bit of an idea of the different sizes of these different machines. And yeah, there's some quite big differences between some of these. Anyway, um, let's pick the Elegoo Satin S, okay? Um, I've talked a lot about Creality lately. Let's go with the Satin S. So in these settings here, we've got common settings to the machine. We can pick the type of resin we're going with. We can name it. We can name a different profile in here. And we can also add in the density. So if we know the grams per milliliter is what it's asking us. So we know the volume versus the weight of a material. We can work that out. We can also put in the cost and we can put it into dollars, euros, whatever your currency might be. What this will mean is that when the slicing software calculates the uh, amount of resin that will be used to create your project, it can calculate a price by taking the volume and converting that into a mass and then converting that mass into a dollars per kilo formula. Very simple stuff. And then you can save the profile for this particular thing, adding them up the top, and then uh, with these different profiles, you can then add in different materials. So for example, you wanna use Syria Tech uh, Tenacious Resin, you wanna use a, a Sunlu uh, ABS-like, you wanna use an Elegoo uh, Standard, whatever it might be, okay? Then we come across into here, into our print settings. So the most important one for quality is gonna be this one here, layer height. Now. 0 0.050, this is what you would call standard height, and this is used for most projects in resin. But as I tailor this channel towards miniatures, we tend to go down to about 0 0.03. Now, if you wanted the highest detail you can get out of these printers, it caps out about 0 0.1, 0 0.01 that is, and that's it. But it is gonna be very slow. In fact, it's gonna be five times slower than 0 0.05, so you have to decide is it worth it? And that's why 0 0.030 is chosen because that is the best sort of compromise between these two different types of processes. Next one up is we have the bottom layer count. So the bottom layer count is that initial uh, material that builds up on the build plate of your 3D printer that all of your supports and parts are going to be attached to, how thick that layer is and how strong it is. And it's going to be this number multiplied by this number because you're taking a 0.03 millimeter thick layer and you're building it up. In this case, it would be 0.15 millimeters thick. So give or take uh, something like seven, not even seven thousandths of a millimeter, uh, sorry, of an inch. Then we've got exposure time. So this exposure time I would call quite high on modern end machines. 2.5 seconds is pretty long, especially when you've got hot resin. So I would probably dial this back to say 2.2, maybe even as low as 1.8 if I can trust the printer. So I would change that setting as well. Let's go 1.8. Now, bottom exposure time. This is a long exposure. Now, long exposures have pros and cons. A pro is your uh, initial, when you perform one of these exposures, the initial one is going to be a longer exposure. You want this because it's going to be a more solid piece of resin because it has been more thoroughly cured. It's gonna be less rubbery. It's gonna be stronger bonded. You do not want this as time goes on with later parts of the print for a couple of reasons. One, the 
print is going to take forever. If it's 30 seconds per layer uh, versus 1.8 seconds per layer, well, it's 15 times, over 15 times, in fact, longer per layer in the print. If you have 10,000 layers, well, do the maths. You could have a print that's meant to go for one hour, it takes 15. If it's meant to go for one day, it takes 15 days. So having a long exposure time is a problem there. Also, screen life is based on hours of usage. The amount of time that the screen, that is blocking out the light projection, which cures the resin, that is hour-based, the lifetime. So the more hours it's running, the less life you get out of that screen. They're all rated for somewhere around uh, 1,000 hours these days. Um, I think you get 20,000 hours out of DLP. That's good. That's excellent time. But why would you go through that effort? And of course, the other problem is that when you have very long exposure times, it means that the resin is getting cured very strongly, and this makes debonding the resin, removing supports, things like that, much more difficult down the line because they're much more strongly bonded and, well, they tend to get very brittle. So we don't want that. So we only want those bottom couple of layers to be the long exposures. And then after they're done, we revert down to the rapid exposures. So these first four numbers are very, very critical. Now the next important numbers over here on the right hand side, bottom lift distance and lift distance. What are these referring to? Well, they're referring to the amount of distance that the print head is going to pull up between each layer. And this is very important because a lower distance means, say, let's say one millimeter. It means that the print is going to be faster because the machine itself is spending less time in between each layer. However, the downside here is that you need the print head to lift up far enough out of the way that the resin can flow and fill in the space underneath the build plate so that when it presses back down, it can squash the resin against the screen and print the next layer. And if you do not lift far enough away, you do not give the resin, because it is quite a viscous, a thick fluid, you're not giving it sufficient time to pull itself into the correct position and in order to fill in that area, that volume. And so you're creating difficulties for yourself. So it's very important not to end up in this situation. That's why lift distance is so critical. And seven millimeters is actually a pretty good lift distance. So we wouldn't change that. Then we have lifting speed. Lifting speed is crucial. The faster that number is, uh, retraction, bottom lift speed, all of this combined, the bigger the number is, the amount of millimeters per minute, the faster the printer is going to move because it'll perform the movement from pressed against the plate to high in the air back to pressed against the plate much faster. The downside of that is the force required exponentially increases because your parts are pressed up against the screen. And if you pull away too quickly, the force holding the part to the screen might become greater than the retention forces of the supports trying to hold your part to the print head. And that's where you'll get a failure. So now that we've got some initial settings in here, which are fine, we also have advanced settings, anti-aliasing, gray blur, this sort of thing. Typically you wanna have anti-aliasing on, it, it just does a nicer job with the um, more finer details around the edges of something. Shrinkage compensation is an option, but you need to understand what you're doing with these. And for the sake of this particular video, which is more of a 101 as opposed to an in-depth uh, full guide to everything you ever need to know, probably not something we want to delve into. So we've got our initial settings set up now for this printer. We can close out of this. So this is our build plate. Now we can move this build plate around in different directions. What we're actually looking at is <laughs> what's well, upside down. We plan everything out upside down and it's actually going to print like this. Now you won't see that until we put something on there. So what we can do now to put something on here is we will drag an item in like so. And now we have it on there. Now remember it prints upside down and well the arrow will face you. So this is what it would look like as it's printing up and down the machine. Now we typically don't tend to print like this in a machine. And in fact, I'll expand open this window a bit now. So we can make the most out of it. All right. So when we print, 
we have a massive surface area here and it's going to be adhered to the build plate. Now, if you have something like a laser etched build plate like the Helot Mage uh, Pro comes with, which I recently uh, showcased, that thing has such great uh, properties for retaining the part on the build plate that if you were to try and make this part, print this part, and then peel it off, it would take chunks out of the part because they are going to stick to the build plate and the resin isn't strong enough to overcome that force. So we need to provide supports and we need to get this thing up off the build plate. So we can go into our support menu here. It will automatically lift it up a certain distance, these distances. So what are we looking at here? Well, we have our light, medium, and heavy. Heavy duty supports have their place. I prefer light supports these days. So as you can see from this little pictogram up in the corner, what it's talking about is the diameter and the thicknesses of these supports. I like light supports, but a lot of them. So I would look at what we call first lift height. So lift height is the amount that we're building this part up from the build plate, as you can again see in this little animation. And you can see it's already added that height in here. We now have to fill that with the support. So I'm gonna pick light support. Now the contact shape, as again in the little animation here, it's showing you how it is joining in to the part. You can have a little concave, little convex, that sort of thing. Down from there, the contact, the contact uh, shape diameter. So that is the size of the part where it is touching against the support or the support diameter where it touches the part, whichever way you like to phrase it. Next from there is contact depth. So this is the amount that it penetrates through the skin of the item. Do you want it to be just kissing against the skin or penetrating in? Typically, we want to choose to be slightly penetrating in there. Connection shape. So do you want a cone? Do you want some other shape in here? Cone is going to be, of course, the most typical. Then you have upper diameter. So how thick is it at the very point where it contacts your part? And that is the top little angle, the one you can see in red. Next, you'll have the lower diameter. And well, that is the uh, other part here. And it's like, well, how thick do you want that at the point where the red meets the rest of the support? And again, we want these things to be in proportion to one another. And then the connection length. So how far away will this support be based upon the length of that cone that runs from the base plate support, the little gray part, to the part itself that you're trying to create. And again, there are little pictograms in slicing software like this, so you can see for yourself if you're unsure. Now, with these particular ones here, I want to have, well, I want to have quite a bit in here, to be honest. And that's where something like density comes in. So how many do I want? I like an 80% density. So I'm going to put that figure in right now, 80%. For my contact diameter, I like to be smaller. So 0.3 to 0.4 is what I like. Contact depth at 0.3 is nice. And of course, we're light. And I'll show you the difference in here between 50% and 80%, for example. Now, what I can do is I can come in and I can either manually add them one at a time, wherever I like on the body. But the first thing I'll do is just hit all. And it does a quick calculation and ta-da, it has covered the surface in parts. If I change this density down to, let's say 30% density, right? I'm gonna use a lot less resin in the supports when I recalculate, but what's going to happen is I now have very little actual grip occurring on the surface. Each one of these dots is all that's holding this gigantic part to the surface of the machine. That's no good. Um, there are times where you can get away with it, but you need to be really careful with that. And I prefer to go for what I know is safe and going to work. So let's say I go with this option. Now I know I've programmed my density correctly because I've printed so many objects in my life. I know that this density, this contact diameter, this type of support is guaranteed to work. But would I print the part like this? And of course the answer is hell no, but why? Well, this sliding bar here allows us to go through every single layer that makes up this part. And there are 1500 layers at 0 0.03 millimeters that make it up. So if we go down to the very bottom layers and bam, this layer here, it's showing us the amount of surface area that's going to be in contact with the screen that is doing the print at that layer height. 
Now have a look at that. How much surface area, especially in proportion to the supports is there? It's a huge amount. Now, if you have a greater amount of surface area attached to the screen or to the FEP, how much less material is holding it to the build plate, right? It's proportionally a crap load less, which means that there is more force holding it to the screen than there is trying to tear it off the screen. This is a guaranteed way to get print failures. So we do not want to orient this way. This is considered a very bad way to do things. So all of that thickness, all of this, no matter every single one of these layers, and there is what, 300 layers versus 170 odd. So let's say 150 layers, 150 chances for this to tear off. That is a lot of risk. We don't want that. So we'll remove all of our supports, and then we're going to bring it back to full height. Now I'm gonna go into my tools, and I wanna reorient this. We wanna rotate it. So when I rotate this object, I can use a couple tools. I can click on the rings themselves, rotate it that way, whatever, yada, yada, yada. Or I can come into here, and I can plug in a value, let's say 30 degrees, right? or I can use these little clickers and select 45s as increments, and I can do it on any axis, any plane at any time. I can also flatten it, whatever it might be. Now I want to angle or orient this part in such a way that I'm going to reduce the load on it. And if I was doing something like say a tank, something like that, I might also just offset it slightly to one side like this. What does that mean? Well, it depends. If I'm going to orient like this, I'm now going to end up with supports on this side of it. Well, that's all good and well, having those supports on the side of this, but it does mean that if I want a beautiful finished side with no deformations or blemishes, because I'm going to be introducing supports, it's going to have a whole bunch of little dots or little increments, blemishes, whatever they might be, left behind. So I have to be careful about doing that. So maybe I'll just go for something more simple. So let's just go for this initial angle. Now I'm going to add my supports in. So it automatically is lifted up again, and then I can automatically add all supports. Okay, what do I think of this? Well, let's look at that layer height now, all the way back down in the 100s. And suddenly our surface area is, well, as you can see, it's quite small. But is this perfect? And of course the answer is no. Why isn't it perfect? Well, let's look at that very first layer that it's printing. That very first layer, what we have here is we have a tiny little, it is hard to orient the camera, I do apologize, but there is a tiny little piece here hanging off the side of support, which is unheld. That is going to bend or peel. So to get the best result here, we would add an extra support to that corner just to stop that from peeling, basically. So come down and then I can put a support right onto that corner if I so desire and that will prevent the peel away from happening because it will take many layers for that issue to solve itself and these are the basic sorts of fault finding these these programs are good at what they can do but they're not perfect and that is a clear example of why but now as we go up every time we are adding a little bit more to this in the amount of surface area that's being held we're also adding a proportional amount of supports to that held face. And we're distributing the force much more evenly as this part is being printed. There's more and more supports constantly coming online. So every layer is being equally supported all the way through the print. Okay, that's ideal for this sort of print. Now, what else do we need to be aware of when we're creating something like this shape? Well. Let's look at another shape, okay? So I'll go back a step, delete this part. I um, made a few samples off to the side here, or downloaded one in one case. Now, let's take this part here. Let's rotate this up, same sort of scenario, bit of an angle. Uh, let's go an even steeper angle, in fact. That'll do. And let's support it. So platform supports all. 
first you look at this and you go, okay, considering the shape it is, that's probably pretty good. The amount of surface area to support ratios, you know, that's great. Okay, but then we have the problem of what's happening at the top of this shape. What's happening up here? What's holding up here? Well, there is a lot of force being applied up there because everywhere we print, we have force being applied. So right now, when the print head comes down, it is trying to squash this upper surface against the build plate, or the build plate's trying to squash it, I should say, up against the screen, and the screen needs to print a layer on it. Now, to do that evenly, an even amount of force needs to be applied across this surface. But how can we apply an even amount of force when the force being applied is leveraged off the center? It's like trying to push on one end of a seesaw and expecting the middle to be the point where the most force is applied. It doesn't work like that. So this is not smart. And also when we have retraction, the force of retraction, well, the part that's retaining is back here, but the part being pulled is up here. It's pulling it off center. It's a great way to delaminate and to have slip. So in order to avoid this from occurring, we need to think about this shape a little bit more complexly. So we can add more supports up here. We could do it manually if we wanted, you know, something like that. And we could add tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of supports. Sure, that is one way we could go. But another way might be to completely reorient this shape or part. So we need to think about every step we make. All right, what if we lower the angle down? Well, we're going to have much greater surface area now proportionally to the bed. And if I slice it, you're going to see that. And when we come down through those layers, you can see there's a lot more surface area now that's got to be supported, but we're relying on having a ton of supports to do the work. Is that ideal? It might not be. Okay, again, it depends on what the surface finish is that you're chasing. We're also relying on this piece up here to be supported uh, by these overhanging little pieces here. That has pros and cons. So let's, again, let's rotate this thing around some more. And this will uh, remove supports, of course, because it has to recalculate them. So let's orient it around to here now. And let's go through the process again. All right, now our supports have dramatically changed. We've got a generous amount of support happening in the overhang, and we've got very little support happening on the edge here. How much do we trust it is the question. Well, let's peel down through the layers, and that again builds up our understanding. So when we get to this point here, we have two distinctly separate parts. And we are hoping that when we get to the end of this print, they line up, that they match up perfectly here. That's a lot of faith to put into something. And as we go down, you'll see that once we get to this height here, we are now starting to again have the leveraging issue because out here, it is unsupported. So the pressure of this part, it might not line up now because it's hanging too far off center. And it's going for quite some time, building up from what, somewhere around layer 2200 through to layer 2700. It's an off-center, unsupported item being leveraged. It's 500 layers. Again, how much strain do you want to put your mechanism under? And then when it finally does join up here, now all of the force in this part, a lot of it is going to these poor supports here, which have to try and not deform or contour. So this is a horrible shape for trying to support. None of those are ideal circumstances for this type of shape. So what is the best way then to print this shape? Well, the best way to print this shape is um, either going to be like this or like this. So let's think about that. If I go like this with the shape, whoop, there we go and I support it, I'm gonna have a very similar amount of support to what I had at the start. And yes, I've got leveraging off center, but it's not far off the support. And if I add just a few supports of my own in along the way here, I can build up quite a bit of, you know, actual foundation to this edge 
where I've now solved the problem, more or less, add a couple more supports in, there we go, and all of the force now that's being applied to this part is gonna be distributed really, really evenly. In fact, this side out here is actually going to be kept in balance by the other side because they'll be printing in unison, which means the force is gonna be distributed evenly between this side and this side up until the point where this side is being printed alone and becomes predominant. At that point, the extra supports I've added here will make up for the fact that there is now an off-center load, okay? That is supports 101. Now, one last thing I wanna show you guys before we finish up this little segment is bring in something a little more complicated. So here is a TAC Marine body. Cool, how do you support this? Well, you could just support it as it is. Let's have a look at it. So add supports to all. And what do we notice? Well, we've got most of our overhangs sorted, but geez, anything around these cables is uh, it's looking, looking pretty nasty, right? We've got these little mini supports in there and uh, do we trust it? Well, no, I wouldn't trust this. I mean, look under all these rivets here. Again, little mini supports, all of these have to be cut off after you finish printing. They'll come off very easily because these are tiny, tiny, tiny things. But there's still more cleaning and such that has to be done. So hells to the no on that one. Let's actually rotate this. Now, how do you rotate a Marine? Well, let's think about it. The front of a Marine, you see everything. What about the back of a Marine? Well, the back of a Marine that is hidden by the backpack. And if it's something like the back of a leg, you can lightly sand it, file it, whatever it might be to get rid of any blemishes. I think 45 is a bit excessive. Let's dial it back somewhere around oh, 20 to 30 degrees is pretty good. And now something like the back of these little leather straps, the turges, the back of those, it doesn't matter if there are blemishes because well, who's gonna see them? By the time this thing is put on a base and there's a backpack or a cloak or whatever in the way, they're hidden from view. So let's support it now and see what happens. Oh, things have dramatically changed. Yes, there are still little supports in, in here on the belt, but instead of it being on every single rivet, it's six of them. There's a tiny couple underneath the teeth of this skull. Yep, but all of the supports are now in the back of this miniature and we've cut down them dramatically. The feet underneath, well, no one's ever gonna see those. The underside of the kneecaps, no one is ever gonna see those. And there's a tiny, tiny little bit here underneath this little skull. And the greater we pitch back the angle on this miniature, the more this effect is gonna be uh, emphasized. So let's do that now. So let's take it up to the 45-ish, I think it's 46 degrees, roughly. Add the supports in again, and let's see what a change we've made. Now we have, what, one single rivet partly supported this tiny little fleck in here. But apart from that, this guy is looking really good. I mean, the entire front of this miniature, there's very little cleanup the work that has to be done. Maybe a few little weird quirks of the editor, like that piece there, is that really doing anything? No. So we could actually delete a support. We can come in there and, and try, although I don't think this, this slicing software would like that personally. Yeah, it doesn't. Um, but there you go. So that's what you would do to slice a marine. And you need to think about it. Parts like, say, in the neck ring, you know you need other parts to socket in and join into that neatly. So you want to be careful with your orientation so that you don't have a ton of supports inside there uh, where it makes it harder for parts to join. Same with the backpack here. Yes, we have a support, but it's only a single support on this actual mating plug. That is easy to clean up to put a backpack onto the miniature. So that is what you need to be thinking about when you're supporting these things. Don't just slap things on the build plate, stand them up vertically and go, this is gonna be right. And for those who knew we angled, why did we angle? Well, this is the reason why we angle things. It's all about the surface area and the layers of support that are happening to the miniature. And if we go down through this process, we can see every single layer that's being created along the way and see that everything is being supported the whole way up rather than having big overhangs and things like that. Every single layer 
the only time that we're starting to leverage off center is when we're getting out to the very, very back here and there's almost no surface area leveraging beyond that point in proportion to the rest of it. So this is really good and that's what we wanna see. All right, so now we're back. I've got the proprietary software up on screen. I get to pick the printer or printers from this list. I've picked this one because I have an Ender 3 S1 and it's covered by this particular printer name. So I hit the next button and it gives me the different settings for the bed. Now I can actually exceed these numbers here. There is room to do it. It just starts to fill the entire build plate and you leave yourself no margin of error for any mechanical error that's built into the machine. And there is error built into these machines but it gives me the basic dimensions of the small machine. It also tells you about the plate size. Is it a round plate? Is it a rectangular plate? Because you can get different ones. Heated bed, build volume, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So all of this can be put in there. You don't have to use Marlin. In fact, there's actually a few different ones to pick from, but again, this is not advanced 3D printing. You don't need to change any of that stuff. Out of the box, all of these settings will be Correct. Now there is one thing you might change and that is the nozzle. So the nozzle is being fed by 1.75 millimeter by default. That is correct. That is the standard size for most uh, filaments that you buy online. However, there are situations where you can buy bigger filaments, such as you are going to be uh, using a large nozzle and rapidly printing. In which case, yes, okay, you might have to change that. But all of these settings straight out of the gate are good. So I'm gonna hit next and I'm presented with this. This is the basic build plate of this particular type of 3D printer. We can rotate around the different dimensions and what we're seeing in that grayed out area is essentially the, when we create the part, there's gonna be a sort of test bed outside of the actual model we're going to print. That is what that is for. So. First thing I'm gonna do is click and drag a file into here. Now that I have, I'll blow this screen up a little bit so you can see what's going on. Now, this file here was one of the uh, war scenery uh, files sent over to me, a uh, slightly older version of the file, but that's all right. And we can start to look around and the red is important because the red tells us something and that is the overhang. Now, once you hit a certain number of degrees, you get this red showing up because it's saying essentially this is unsupported. Now, you can build supports into filament printing. Nobody likes doing it though, and I am one of those people because the way these supports work is, well, for a start, they take up a lot of material. Surprisingly, they can take up as much or more material than the actual print itself. And the supports are never, never great apparently. Uh, so what you want to try and find is you want to find essentially your red areas. You don't want greater than a 45 degree angle. If it's a 45 degree angle, it will always print perfectly. Now, in this example, we actually have some sections which are flat that stick out straight out. Now you can print into the air because that's what's happening here is as the printer is moving along, we are slicing into the air at that level. And in fact, if I hit slice, and it has actually worked it all out. Yeah, so that would be 116 grams and into the air at that height. We don't want to print into the air generally because if there's nothing to hold up the molten material, it will just droop and sag and it will cause issues. So. You can do it for very short spans, such as under these pipes up the top. Short distances like this, it's perfectly okay, and it will not give you any real issues. But if you were doing a large span, if the pipe came out 30 mils, that starts to create difficulties because you're asking a lot of the machine and you have to start playing with settings like speed and cooling in order to allow it to work correctly. We want to avoid going down that path, basically. So. We've created um, this miniature now. I've hit slice and it's telling me it's 116 grams of material. It, I can save it to file. That would be saving it to the SD card, uploading it to cloud, whatever it might be to put on the printer. 
Now, just like with the resin, you can calculate what this means. Now, with the resin, it does an automatic calculation to say, yep, you are going to spend this much money on this print. In this case, we don't have that luxury, but we can say 116 grams, let's just call it 100 grams. This is roughly going to cost us one-tenth of the cost of a 25 kilo uh, spool of PLA. So it's going to cost us about $2.50. And this part for reference, if I click into here, into my demos and grab that Mark IV Sergeant that you saw earlier, that's the size of the part. So for $2, you've created something that's bigger than a Space Marine Land Raider, marginally bigger than a Space Marine Land Raider. Yeah, this is why FDM, fantastic for uh, printing this sort of stuff. By the way, you can print um, that miniature. I would not. So uh, this machine is just not designed for that. You do get warning errors um, from things like internal inconsistencies in the frame now you can build these on a with a range of different settings so we have settings up the top here that we can click on but we can also go into custom settings i like custom settings personally because it gives me a lot more control over it now the first thing to look at here is the shell so the shell in the is the wall thickness your floor thickness uh wall lines etc etc these are good settings at the gate if you want to use less material inside of a print, you typically increase your wall thickness and increase your top and bottom layer thickness because these layers are going to be the most solid part of the miniature. And if you have less internal volume, less internal framework to support it, then yeah, you need to compensate for that in some way. And so you do that by creating stronger external uh, barriers or walls. So you can modify those. The next one down from that is infill. Now this is the internal framework. You can go as low as 3% pretty comfortably. I usually go about 4, 5%. And infill density, uh, sorry, infill line distance, 30 millimeters, that's fine. I don't like cubic. Uh, I found through mm, semi-scientific testing that gyroid is the best pattern. So these different patterns, if I'll briefly talk about those, these are the shape of the zigzags that occur back and forth inside the model. So these will not be visible to you on the finished model, but what is happening here is an internal frame, similar to the supports on a resin print, is occurring inside the model. And it's to fill up the void without it being completely hollow like a balloon where it's easy to crush the finished part. It's providing structural rigidity. And there is, say, grid, cubic, uh, concentric, okay, what do these mean? Well, it's the shape of that. So if you look at triangles from above, it is literally a series of triangles going back and forth inside of it. Try hexagon, it's exactly what you think. Uh, it's hexagonal shapes. Cubic, hey, it's a square shape. Zigzag, it's a zigzag. Concentric is rings going around inside. And cross gives you a pattern where you have a cross that turns into a box back into a cross throughout. Gyroid is my favorite, and it's a wobbly line from one side to the other uh, that makes these weird ribbons, but it is very speed efficient, and that's why I love it. It's the most speed efficient that I've found in my testing, and I have printed tables and tables and tables of terrain, as you will see. Then we can go into materials. So in materials, we have printing temperature. Now it starts you out at 200 and at 50 degrees. So 200 on the nozzle, the hot end, and 50 degrees on the build plate. If you are printing with PLA and PLA plus, going up to 60 degrees on the build plate and 215 on the printing temperature won't hurt you at 100% flow because it will essentially counter for any slight cold spots in that material. And it does occur from time to time. But when you start playing with these, if you go up to extremely high temperatures, you can cause damage to the material that the bed is made out of. You can damage the material itself because not all materials are designed to operate at high temperatures. PLA is pretty forgiving though. Uh, but if you are printing something like nylon, you need to go 400 degrees at the uh, nozzle and you need to be printing onto glass 
So there are considerations to keep in mind. You shouldn't have to touch it though. Speed now. Typically the lower the speed, so giving it the maximum amount of time to get hot material down and cool that material off before the printer moves on, means a better finish. And so you can drop the speeds on everything by half and increase the travel speed so it moves from one spot to another to start a new part of the print quicker. That might be the way you do it. Personally though, a lot of the settings out of the gate are kind of matched to the printers these days. Again, depending on the sizing software you use, this company has set it up to suit their printers and I found they actually did a really good job of it. So don't fix what isn't broke, but that's what it's talking about. And of course, travel, travel and retraction. So when you print and you print one part of the model and the printer goes to move to another part of the model, you need retraction. It needs to pull some of that molten plastic back, like pulling more material into the syringe. And the reason this is done is because any hot material will slowly dribble out under gravity through the nozzle and it will leave plastic in the wrong areas. It can deposit it where you don't want it. So in order to stop that from occurring, it does what they call a retraction. Five millimeter retraction is good. That's pretty much the standard quote unquote distance of retraction. And the speed in millimeters per second, the higher you go, the faster the process is, but you risk things like slip. That is where the gears that are pulling the material back slide on the material so they don't have enough friction or force to actually pull the material back quickly enough. Trade-offs for everything. Retraction is very important for high quality parts. Typical rule, big retraction better. Now, cooling. Fan speed, yeah, you want to you want to have as much cooling as you can. You can print without cooling, but there is a trade-off because you're relying on the ambient air temperature to cool the molten plastic. And if it gets too hot, you get things like wobbles and sags to your material. There is a fine balance between it being hot enough when it leaves the nozzle and solidifying onto the product you are manufacturing. Don't mess with it if you don't know what you're doing with it. Then we get to support. If we could generate support, it won't show it to us in this program. But what it will do is it will come up with a very light framework that prints very similar to the rest of it, but is designed to not be durable, to break apart when you put any tools or even your fingers on it. I don't like printing with supports in these programs. If I'm going to, I'm going to use a different slicing program for another proprietary software manufacturer and find the uh, support generator that allows me uh, the best results and is not this one. Build plate adhesion. Now, skirt, brim, raft, none. What do they mean? So when you have a skirt, what you're doing is you are creating a pattern that is going around the object, okay? So it's a single layer, as it says in its description there, around your model, and it's designed to stop the edges lifting up and warping, okay? When you've got brim, it's similar again, but this time it's not connected to the model. So it runs a line like a border or a picture frame around the outside of it. And you use this sort of uh, uh, ad adhesive method, I suppose. I like to use it to essentially clean the nozzle out, get rid of any crappy plastic in it, make sure the nozzle is extruding correctly between the point where I start up the machine and starting the print. And raft. Now raft is, it looks like a waffle. That's the best way I can describe it. It is a semi-hollow print that is laid down a couple millimeters thick beneath the main print. It can be peeled easily off the main print and off the build plate itself. And what it does is it provides you a large surface area to grip the build plate for your model to adhere to. Raft has a place, and that place is if you're doing something that doesn't have a huge amount of uh, surface area present on the build plate, and that is the only time it's worth using. Typically, none or brim. I'll select brim. Now, dual extrusion. It's not set up on this machine, but if you have dual extrusion, 
Um, dual extrusion is where you have two different filaments that are able to feed in and I can swap from one to the other, say you want to use two different colors. Um, mesh fixes, special modes and experimental, you won't need to touch them. If you are capable of it, you don't need me, you don't need this video. So that's it for the generic stuff. But this model is basically out of the gate ready to go. Again, just keep an eye on things like these 90 degree overhangs where you are printing into thin air because those are the parts that you risk the most failure. Now I've printed eight of these so far, this particular model on the one printer with zero hiccups. So it's working fantastically. There is nothing wrong with this model, but like I said, that red is just giving you an indication like, hey, if you're gonna have an issue, this is where it might arise. Now, where does this type of printing fail? Well, it fails in slow and gentle elevation changes, such as on top of these four pieces here. So on a slow, steady angle, vertically, no problem. But on this shallow angle, what happens is you end up with a layer and then another layer and then another layer and then another layer. And because your steps are so large at 0.2 millimeter increments, you get very obvious stepped lines heading up the model. Now on these modern printers, whilst they are very visible um, to start with, you can lightly sand them back, put a small amount of epoxy resin on there and sand that back. You can uh, use a filler primer. There are all sorts of ways of getting rid of it, but, but understand it will be there. This medium was not designed for like a long shallow slope like that in mind. If you wanted to have a slope which is long shallow wedge shape you do it vertically you do not do it horizontally okay in these machines is a major limitation and like i was saying before surface area is king on these you want to be adhered to the build plate you don't want to be like on a resin printer um, printing all these parts in some weird angle up in the air it is going to cause you grief you want to lay this stuff down uh, flat onto the build plate if you can avoid uh, any of these things that try and screw you around they're just going to cause you trouble and of course there are a lot of other cool things you can do with this uh, slicing software you can do things like you know scaling all, all printers have scaling software built in but you can produce much larger models than what was originally intended with these uh, with these programs move it up Make sure you are in the good position on the build plate as well, or else you're gonna have issues because it was still uh, in the negatives. You can actually drop a miniature down, funny enough, without using any external software. You can print just part of a miniature. I could actually lower this down and just print, say, the top half of this. If I slice this now, it will actually just print the top half of this miniature. It's a neat little trick that I, uh, <laughs> I have done in the past. It, it does have it. That's uh, it's our uh, moments where that's kind of handy. So yeah, keep in mind you can do that. Anyway, that's it for uh, FDM. FDM slicing is a lot more simple. There's a lot less to do with it, and a lot less that can go wrong as long as you pick the correct model. Where it goes wrong typically is people pick the incorrect model and they start doing crazy things with it and they wonder why they get failures. So pick something simple like this, uh, print terrain, print these sort of objects that look great. The layer lines will be virtually invisible on modern good machines and you're laughing. Anyway, on with the rest of the video. So then we're getting to the end of this video and I think I may have a part two in mind. We're getting to picking the best 3D printer and here we fall into a conundrum because I don't know what's best for you in your circumstances. And I get asked a lot of the same sort of questions from people like, what's better, the Elegoo Mars or, or maybe do I get an Anycubic Photon? Here's the thing, they're all the same. And as a reviewer, a person who's looked at many of these machines, I can say that there are certain features that appeal more than others. For example, Elegoo. I like Elegoo printers. I don't recommend them. And a lot of people will be hissing at me right now because they love Elegoo, but Elegoo has a fatal flaw, and that is the ball head mount. It's awful. And Elegoo people, I get it, you, you, your printers are fantastic. Kill the ball mount off. 
it is seriously hampering what is otherwise a fantastic design on your larger printers uh, like Jupiter now I don't think they use them because they know they're trash but they use them on all the uh, the Mars series printers and the Saturns don't do it nobody likes the ball head at ball heads they misalign easier you can do more damage to them by over talking than you can on other types of print heads just don't do it and it's almost like people who are fanatics for a car brand or a tech brand of some kind or a miniatures company whatever it might be and they just think that everything that comes out is great you know like the crazy star wars fan who just loves everything star wars because it has star wars on it i've met a few elegoo fans that are like that and i've met a few fans who have any cubic of reality whatever it might be okay they come in all shapes and sizes but there are disadvantages and i will never recommend an elegoo printer because of that despite having printers that i really do think are well well good quality um maybe their uh filters could be a bit better that's probably the other complaint i have about them then you've got creality creality make pretty good printers as well but they're not the big name uh in in uh sla that say um any cubic is for example any cubic and elegant have really cornered the market and of course you've got like frozen for example they're also a big player in that market what does Creality bring to the table? They don't. Well, with the Hellot Mage Pro, resin pump, and speed. Okay, emptying out that nasty resin vat with relative ease. I do like that feature. Doesn't fill it very well, though. Like, that was one of my big criticisms of that unit. Is that enough, though? Then again, look at any cubic. Any cubic is now doing auto bed leveling, and it works out how much pressure is being applied to a certain part of the surface in order to work it out. And it will even do things like uh, sense that if you've got a failure, because it goes, geez, there should be more suction pressure than this. There should be more resistance uh, applied to the electric motor when I try and lift the print head up. Hmm, you've probably got a failed part. How about I send you a warning and you come and check it? That's cool technology. So it's finding the thing that appeals to you most. There are gimmicks as well. If someone says it's an 8K printer, but it's the size of, you know, an Elegoo Mars or a Hallett One, or an Enigubic Photon. Congratulations, you're not getting the full 8K worth. 4K at that size screen is plenty. Okay, and now they're doing 16K printers coming out at the size of um, the Hallett Mage Pro, or the Enigubic Photon Mono X, or whatever the current version is. I always get mixed up because they have all these brands have weird terminology. The only one who's got good terminology is Elegoo. Because at least Elegoo just says Mars 1, Mars 2, Mars 3. Like it's a really simple system. I do really appreciate that. Now these printers come out and they've got these gimmicks. And it's like, well, is the gimmick worth it? That's up to you to decide. But I will have this suggestion for you. If you can get a mono LCD as opposed to an RGB, go for the mono because RGB has a much slower print time and a much worse screen life. But of course, mono has become the standard in the last few years. Again, as the technology becomes more widely adopted, gets cheaper, etc., etc. So keep that in the back of your mind. And all of these things, they have the same sort of print sizes and build plates and things like that. So it's it's what stands out to you. Okay, and when I do a review, I'm saying, does this meet my needs? And often, it's yes. And if it's a no, well, I kind of tear them a new one. And again, it's entirely up to you. Now, when it comes to filament, I am very much a diehard Creality fan. And that is because they are the name in filament printing. And I think they have been for a long time, at least at the consumer level. And it started back with the Ender 3. They came with a design which everyone has copied since. Okay, there might have been other people who tried something very similar to it at the same time or even before it, but they're the ones who really, you know, polarized the community and made it the standard. And they also had the CR series, but I don't think that ever did as well as the Ender series did. And that is where I go to typically when it comes to my printers. And I have knocked back Creality Molds before. I've knocked back many printers that have been sent to me for review because I didn't have time or... I didn't think it offered something new that was worth talking about. This does happen. 
Some manufacturers don't even come and offer it to me at all. I've, even though I've bought both Elegoo and Anycubic, never heard a peep out of either company. Uh, just, that's fine, is what it is. But it does make it harder to review newer models because I'm not set when I've got decent printers already to go out of my way to spend what little money uh, the channel generates to go and buy, you know, some 8K, 4K new prototype model, especially from someone like Anycubic, who, as I said, I've not had a bad experience with them. But Anycubic is constantly putting out new models to the point where it gets kind of frustrating because they never seem to settle on a technology. They bought in a DLP printer a couple of years ago, which seemed to be fantastic in every regard. Tried it out, liked it, uh, had people who... Uh, and it was a friend's one I should borrow, tried it out. Don't even think I did a video on it. But I, I had a positive experience, recommended it to another person. They bought it, said they loved it. Great, okay. What have we heard about DLP from them since? Not an awful lot. Instead, they've just been going back to sort of the tried and true methods of LED exposure and such. Same as uh, you get weird proprietary things like what Formlabs does. And it's just, it's a nightmare when it comes to picking all these different printers out. So my advice to you is pick what you think suits your circumstances. And that may sound like horrible consumer advice because some people just come in here and say, well, I just want to know what's good. So with that in mind, I will add to that a caveat. First, pick what suits your circumstances. Second, look for a large and reputable brand. It's not that I don't like seeing smaller brands picked out uh, for their special features from amongst the crowd and given the light of day and allowed to grow, uh, that should be encouraged. But it should be the 3D printing enthusiasts who know a lot about this, who can fault find things, they're the ones who should be doing it. The regular customer just needs something they can trust off the shelf. So go to a big manufacturer. And yet there will be times where you get a dud. I'll be honest. And a lot of these companies are based in China. So when you do get a dud, communication can be a little bit difficult and customer service can become a problem. And so I'll throw in another caveat. Find a big company and don't buy it from them. Buy it through something like Amazon or eBay or another third-party retailer who has a good return policy. So if you buy something like an uh, Creality Hellot One Plus, you take it home, something's wrong with the screen, you contact Creality, you get a bunch of nonsense talk and they're telling you to fault find for things that you know aren't wrong with it, you're just like the screen isn't working, why are you telling me to touch the screw on the back of the machine? Don't worry about it, right? Just go to the man, the person who sold it to you instead, the third party, independent, in the middle, and just return it. 99 out of 100 times, they'll just accept it straight back and sort you out. They're fantastic like that. I had an issue with a... Creality circuit board happens from time to time. You know, I think a capacitor blew on it. I just contacted the, the party. It was within a year of purchasing. It's like, well, that falls well inside the warranty period on that particular part of the machine. And they just said, how much is it for a new one? And they sent me out the money for it. And I said, look, I'm happy to install a new one uh, rather than send the whole printer back. They were happy with that. I was happy with that. So they paid to send out a new chip for that computer. And I installed the new chip myself. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Um, so those are the three things. Find a printer that suits you, find a large reputable brand because you know it's gonna have a lot of people who have the same printer. It's not gonna be a niche product, therefore you'll get good support from the community. And then buy it through a third party retailer because like I said, it is hard to track down this stuff and communicate with people who speak a completely alien language to you because there are going to be communication blunders, and let's face it, most countries are pretty toothless when it comes to consumer advocacy. Anyway, that's it for me. This is my quick 101. I say quick 101, it's probably an hour-long video by the time I assemble it all, uh, but talking about 3D printing for you, getting into miniature wargaming 3D printing, and what you need to look out for and think of when you are slicing. What settings are important for you? I'm Mac with the Outer Circle. Thank you all for watching. And if this has inspired a 3D printing bug in you, you know, if I can shield myself for a moment, go over and check out my miniatures on Colt 3D. Do a range of stuff there for alternate sculpts of things or models that aren't in production. And well, you can figure out the rest for yourself.
or buy someone else's great stuff. Support your local community. Make it the outer circle. See you next time.